I must confess that I'd never heard of comfort addiction before, but typing into that great source of knowledge, Dr. Google, I discovered quite a number of articles on comfort addiction, such as, are you ready to start conquering your dangerous addiction to comfort? Or another paper, living in the age of comfort addiction. In a recent article written by Helen Kerwin-Taylor, she suggests that some people are addicted to indulgence and refers to some celebrities such as Queen Victoria, Hillary Clinton and Kate Moss. Kerwin-Taylor quotes a number of examples such as the rock band Pink Floyd who toured the world with an ambience director to ensure that their every whim and desire was catered for when they were on tour. Or Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones has a shepherd's pie made for him before every Stones gig. And the singer, Lionel Richie, takes his own scented candle to ward off unsavoury smells and make places feel like home. Some celebrities, of course, always request the same table at their favourite restaurants. But the question is, is comfort addiction really a psychological condition? I would suggest that few people would be willing to admit publicly to an addiction. And perhaps the word addiction is being used in a light-hearted way when we compare it to other addictions that can have such a devastating effect on a person's life. Kerwin Taylor's article's rationale for calling comfort addiction an addiction is that there are certain elements, she recognises, which correspond to other addictions, such as mood modification, withdrawal symptoms and interpersonal conflicts. And then she goes on to say more specifically, Comfort is similar to addictive substances such as alcohol, sugar and cocaine and makes people feel temporarily better and soothes away life's irritants. Mood modification, any sudden comfort leads to people's experiencing a, combine, a com combination rather, of acute anxiety and helplessness. And then, with withdrawal symptoms, she says, there are people who are prepared to miss social events with friends because they are afraid to experience any type of discomfort. And it has been recorded that some people will bring their own eating and drinking utensils when staying in a hotel or a friend's place. I had a friend who always took his own food on board when he flew first class. There are, of course, various levels of comfort. When King Salam of Saudi Arabia was due to stay at the one and only Rithi Ra Resort in the Maldives in 2017, he asked for exclusive use of the resort and that it be repainted and fitted out with gold handrails. And at his request, a private hospital was also built on site and nannies, personal trainers, security guards and chefs were flown in by private jet. In the end, the king never turned up. There are other factors to consider with comfort addiction. There is what we call comfort inflation, which turns into expectation. Standards inflate over time, don't they? When you were travelling as a student in your gap year, a sleeping bag and a stretcher was okay each night. By the time you're 40, you can only sleep in a king size. And business class gets you on and off the plane first. If you're flying economy and you get upgraded, you're elated. But if it works the other way, well, you're fuming. It's easier to adjust upwards rather than downwards. Comfort, then, is about convenience, privacy and safety. It is all about control. 
Because when you're lumped into cattle class, you have no idea who you're going to be sitting next to. And when you have adjusted to new standards, it is inevitable that you want more. George Harrison from the Beatles once said, do you remember when we were so poor we had to fly first class? Norman Doig, the author of the book The Brain That Changes Itself, says this, too much comfort lowers resilience and with the ability to deal with challenges. It is the, it is the willingness to leave the comfort zone behind that is key to keeping the brain new. In our reading from Mark, Mark, of course, is a gospel of conflict and controversy. Jesus intrudes, assaults, seems intent on provoking confrontation and conflict. Rather than being the comforter, he becomes the disturber. He often broke the Jewish purity laws by having close contact with lepers, corpses, prostitutes and tax collectors. And in this passage from Mark 6, Jesus encounters rejection and conflict from his own town people. They thought of him as an unimpressive hometown boy from Nazareth. And we are indebted to the Gospel of Thomas, where this saying appears in its earliest form. And it says this, No prophet is welcome on his home turf. Jesus had provoked a fierce resistance, even among those who were closest to him. And Mark links this story of rejection with the sending out of the disciples, as if to say, that the rejection and discomfort that Jesus experienced, well, you guys are going to cop it too. Jesus, therefore, gives instructions on how to handle the inevitable conflict. And it is interesting to consider that Jesus preached away more people than he attracted. Jesus gives instructions then for the road. These instructions contain a series of prohibitions, permissions and rejections. It is prohibited to carry food, a knapsack, money or a change of clothes. It is permitted to carry a staff and to wear sandals. It is prohibited to move around in the same town. And those who refuse to accept extend hospitality or to listen to the good news are to be symbolically rejected. A question that the Jesus Seminar scholars considered was whether these rules of the road, as they were called, originated with Jesus, who appears to have followed similar rules himself, or whether they were developed by the early Jesus movement as it sought to spread its message throughout Palestine and the Mediterranean Basin. The scholars decided that these instructions are older than their incorporation into the earliest written gospel, which is Mark, but there was some disagreement as to whether any of them could be traced back to Jesus. So, a question. Does the church exist to make me feel comfortable and to meet my needs, or what? Philip Kennison and James Street in their book, Selling Out the Church, say this. Which needs should the church attempt to meet? Who determines which needs the church will not attempt to meet? Is the meeting of people's needs designed to make people feel comfortable? We live in an age when many people are convinced that the church should get into marketing and that the church should be more consumer-oriented. Ministers are encouraged to create what we call user-friendly worship service in which people feel comfortable and have their needs met. Churches are encouraged to devise their programs to fit the felt needs of the congregation. And in this view... The activity called worship is a product 
that congregations offer for consumption, with the primary concern being on how to attract and satisfy more customers and how to keep the ones we've got. Kennison and Street say this, by living in a society in which most daily choices are consumer choices, people have come to the view that their relationship to the church is in a similar way. But once people come to view choosing a church in ways similar to choosing among competing brands and styles of basketball shoes, then enormous pressure is exerted on the church to conceive of itself in those terms as well. This tendency then towards consumerism may be one of the most detrimental contemporary temptations for the church, designed to make us all feel comfortable. But years ago, the sociologist Ferdinand Tuonis criticised the role of the market in creating a society in which there was no real community, but rather only individuals who approached others with the attitude, I give so you can give back to me. What if the church serves people, not as a market transaction, but because we are the people of God? What if I am speaking to you today, not because I think it is in the uttermost part of your brain to come to a church service at St Michael's as your weekly wants, but rather because I think I might be able to contribute to your spiritual life and to challenge you to think about your faith and its relationship to your community and society. So what is the greatest service the church can offer our community? Perhaps the service we offer is not necessarily what society thinks it needs. The church is not only about meeting my needs, but also about rearranging my needs, making me aware of needs that maybe I was previously unaware. The church is not only here to meet people's needs, but also to be a countercultural presence, calling people into a new life and humanity in God. So instead of marketing, our primary metaphor ought to be formation and transformation into a new spiritual experience. So we need to spend more energy into how we, St Michael's as a Christian community in the city, can enable and inspire our members to be concrete embodiments of the gospel so that we can offer a profound, perhaps even radical alternative to the dominant structures and institutions of our day. Someone surely left Capernaum that day after listening to Jesus and would have said, I'm sorry, but that new preacher just didn't do anything for me. Some that were present that day, a few realised that Jesus was taking them out of their comfort zone and leading them to a more significant place than just meeting their needs. Our blessing. Divine Presence, give us your peace on this day and in all our next days. Surround us with the care of those who know us and give us the wisdom, love and strength to make a place here for all people that is safe, compassionate, just and free from violence. Amen.